Today we are going to read the book, Women in Science, 50 Fearless Pioneers Who Changed the World, written and illustrated by Rachel Ignatovsky. I like this cover. Can you see how it's metallic and the colors? And uh, you might be able to see I have some marked in here. We're not going to read all 50 together, but I will show you the 50. We're going to read some of them. Um, this book is very long. So there's an introduction. There's just like Hypatia, Maria, Sibalia, Marion, Wang, Zeni, Mary Anning, Ada Lovelace, Elizabeth Blackwell, Hertha, Ertron, Karen Horney, uh, Nettie Stevens, Florence Bascom, Marie Curry, Mary Agnes Chase, there's a timeline, Lisa Meitner, Lillian Gilbreth, Emmy Nyther, Edith Clark, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Alice Ball, Gertie Corey, Joan Beauchamp Proctor, Cecilia Payne, Gopin Schnick, Kapo Chicken, okay. Barbara McClintock, Maria Goper Meyer, Grace Hopper, Rachel Carson, there's the lab tools, Rita Levi uh, Montalacini, Dorothy Hod Hodgkin, um, Chian Sheng Wei, Heidi Lamar, Mamie Phillips Clark, Gertrude Elion, Katherine Johnson, Jane Cook Wright, Rosalind Franklin, Rosalind Yallow, Esther Letterbridge, Statistics in STEM, Vera Rubin, Annie Easley, Jane Goodell, Sylvia Earle, Valentina Tereshkova, Patricia Bath, Christine Noslian, Jocelyn Bell Bernal, Saul Lowe, Wu, Elizabeth Blackburn, Katia Croft, Mae Jemison, May Britt Moser, Miriam Mirza Kadmi, um, more women in science listed, a conclusion, glossary, sources, acknowledgements about the, the author, and an index. So there's lots of people featured in this book. And I think you could probably tell by how I was doing my best with pronunciation that the people are from all over the world, too. So um, we are going to be reading just a few of these from Women in Science. going to read the introduction. So I am going to read it and just hold it and then I'll show you some of the pictures. It says, nothing says trouble like a woman in pants. That was the attitude in the 1930s anyway, when Barbara Mc McClintock wore slacks at the University of Missouri. It was considered scandalous. Okay, so it was considered a scandal or like big news that she was wearing pants. <laughs> Even worse, she was feisty, direct, in incredibly smart, and twice as sharp as most of her male colleagues. She did things her way to get the best results, even if it meant working late with her students, who were breaking curfew. If you think these seem like good qualities for a scientist, then you are right. But back then, these weren't necessarily considered good qualities in a woman. Her intelligence, her self-confidence, her willingness to break rules, and, of course, her pants— were all considered shocking. Barbara had already made her mark on the field of genetics with her groundbreaking work at Cornell University, mapping chromosomes using corn. This work is still important in scientific history. Yet, while working at the University of Missouri, Barbara was seen as bold and unladylike. The faculty excluded her and that they would fire her if she got married Oh, wait, the faculty excluded her from meetings and gave her little support with her research. When she found out that they would fire her if she got married and there was no possibility of promotion, she decided she had enough. Risking her entire career, she packed her bags. With no plans except an unwillingness to compromise her worth, Barbara went off to find her dream job. 
This decision would allow her to joyously research all day and eventually make the discovery of jumping genes. This discovery would win her a Nobel Prize and forever change the, how we view genetics. Barbara McClintock's story is not unique. As long as humanity has asked questions about our world, men and women have looked to the stars, under rocks, and through microscopes to find the answers. Although both men and women have the same thirst for knowledge, women have not always been given the same opportunities to explore the answers. In the past, restrictions on women's access to education were not uncommon. Women were not often not allowed to publish scientific papers. Women were expected to grow up to exclusively become good wives and mothers while their husbands provided for them. Many people thought women were just not as smart as men. The women in this book had to fight these stereotypes to have the careers they wanted. They broke rules, published under pseudonyms, that's like a fake name. And worked for the love of learning alone. When others doubted their abilities, they had to believe in themselves. When women finally began gaining wider access to higher education, it was usually a catch. Often they would be given no space to work, no funding, no recognition. Not allowed to enter the university building because of her gender, Lisa Meitner did her radiochemistry experiments in a dark basement. Without funding for a lab, physicist and chemist Marie Curry handled dangerous radioactive elements in a tiny, dusty shed. After making one of the most important discoveries in the history of astronomy, Cecilia Payne Gapushkin still got little recognition, and for decades her gender limited her uh, to work as a technical assistant. Creativity, persistence, and a love of discovery were the greatest tools these women had. Marie Curie is now a household name, but throughout history, there, has been, there have been so many other great and important women in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Many did not receive the recognition they deserved at the time and were forgotten. When thinking of physics, we should not only name Albert Einstein, but also the genius mathematician Emmy Noether, we should know all that it wait. We should all know that it was Rosalind Franklin who discovered the du double helix structure of DNA, not James Watson and Francis Crick. While admiring the advances in computer technology, let us remember not only Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, but also Grace Hopper, the creator of modern programming. Throughout history, many women have risked everything in the name of science. This book tells the stories of these scientists from ancient Greece to the modern day, who in the face of no said, try and stop me. All right, so let's look here. It says, how does this work? Why did this happen? What does, what does, what is this? Where did this come from? How can I help? I have an idea. So I love this introduction. Um, really kind of setting the scene here that you know, in history, women were limited with what they could do in science, whether it was going to school, they weren't allowed to, or getting a job or getting funding to do the work that they want to. So we live in a very different time period. Um, and all of that has been with progress from people that like the ones we're going to read about today. So um, whoever you are, if you're a boy, if you're a girl, if you're a man, if you're a woman, whatever, uh, if you are non-binary, like you can be whatever you want. And I want you to um, listen to some more of these stories and I hope that they inspire you. And if this is a book you want to read more of, um, please get this at the library. It's Women in Science, 50 Fearless Pioneers Who Changed the World, written and illustrated by Rachel Ign Ignatowski. All right, we're going to read about Wang Zhenyi. And I'm going to hold this up so you can see those illustrations. They are gorgeous. And the author is also the illustrator. 
to Wang Zhenyi, astronomer, poet, and mathematician. Wang Zhenyi was one of the greatest scholars in China. She was born in 1768 during the Qing Queen Dynasty. At the time, China had a strict feudal system. Education was only for the wealthy, and women were expected to cook, sew, and not be bothered by studies. Wang Zhenyi was fortunate to be born into a family of scholars who valued her education. Her grandfather and father taught her astronomy and math. She also traveled extensively and saw how extreme taxation affected the less fortunate. Learning about the harshness of poverty inspired her to write poetry, decrying, decreeing injustice. So she would write poetry to let people know uh, how she wasn't treated fairly. In Wang Zhenyi's day, eclipses were considered mysterious and beautiful, but were not well understood. She had theories about how they worked, and she created her own eclipse model using a mirror, a lamp, and a globe that she tied up with ropes around a table. She used it to prove her theories about how motion, or how about how the moon blocks our view of the sun, or the earth blocks the sun's light from reaching the moon during an eclipse. And there were many other planetary problems to solve. Wing Zenyi scientifically studied the Chinese calendar system and used her telescope to measure the stars and further explain the rotation of the solar system. She was also dedic a dedicated mathematician. Her struggles with math would often make her stop and sigh, but she pushed through those tough moments. She understood a complicated arithmetic theories, and at age 24, she published a five-volume guide for beginners called Simple Principles of Calculation. This work, compiled with six years after Wang Zeni's death, compiled six years after Wang Zeni's death, was prefaced by the famous scholar Quan Yiji and read by many. Wang Zeni lived only to age 29, but she is remembered as one of the greatest minds of the Qing Dynasty. She published many volumes of writing on math, astronomy, and poetry, and her work influenced legions of scientists, mathematicians, and writers who came after her. Now read about Joan Beauchamp Proctor. Joan Beauchamp Proctor always had a fascination with reptiles. She was born in England in 1897 and grew up in a time when women were seen as dainty and reptiles were considered exotic and dangerous. Joan's chronic ill health kept her from going to, uni to a university, but it didn't keep her from studying the animals she loved. Joan kept snakes, frogs, and even a crocodile as pets. She used her animals to present a paper to the Zoological Society of London when she was only 19. In 1917, she started officially working at the British Museum as an assistant to George Albert Bollinger keeper of the reptile and fishes. In 1923, she became the London Zoo's curator of reptiles and discovered a brand new species from Australia called the Peninsula Dragon Lizard. The newspapers went crazy for this small blonde, blonde woman handling huge pythons and lizards. To the public, it was very odd to see a woman 
work with such creatures. She became famous, at first for the novelty, but soon the world saw her genius. She worked closely with architects to design the zoo's reptile house, which was built in 1926 and is still used today. It was the first of its kind built specifically for the reptile's comfort. I love this. It says, but soon the world saw her genius. I think that's what I'm trying to get you to understand, that we all have a genius or something part of us, inside of us, that we can tap into and, and be amazing. Um, and you gotta, you got to believe in yourself. And, and it's hard to know what that is. I think I'm still trying to figure that out. But I love hearing these stories of people that follow their hearts, follow their dreams. All right, let's look here. It says, oh, we're going to finish reading. It says, Joan was recognized as an expert in herpetology and published many papers on, on this science. Joan revealed that the secret of a zoo is to make the animals feel at home. She used her artistic talents to make the environment look and feel like their natural habitat. On the job training and her special relationship with the animals made her an excellent veterinarian. Under her care, reptiles were living longer than ever before in captivity. Her love and understanding of these reptiles led her to get to know each animal as an individual. She even kept a tame Komodo dragon as a pet. Her chronic ill health eventually caught up with her. She would still come to work when she could, making her rounds in a wheelchair with her Komodo dragon on a leash. She died at the age of 34 in 1931, but her legacy lives on at the London Zoo. And that is Joan Beauchamp Proctor. She was a zoologist. Now read about Qian Xiang Wu, and she's an experimental physicist. And I will tell you, I'm doing my best with the names, but if I'm mispronouncing them, my apologies. Um, but sometimes I don't get too hung up on how to say names unless I have somebody to help me. Um, I like when people correct me if I don't say their name correctly. But when I'm reading and I'm trying to understand a story, I do my best with the, the way to pronounce the name. Um, until I can find more information. So um, it's okay sometimes to kind of think of it the way you think of it. And if you want to find out exactly how to say it, or if you're expected to know how to say it, you can do more research and you can find out. But I, I see sometimes students get so caught up on how to say someone's name that they miss all of the amazing parts of that person's story. So I think you can type in Google, um, you know, words to pronounce. So um, I should do that, shouldn't I? Okay, look at Qian Xiang Wu. Qian Xiang Wu was born in China in 1912 when not all women were expected to become educated. Qian Xiang Wu's father was a pioneer for women's rights and started the first school in town for girls. Her family always gave her the support to attend the best schools, no matter the distance or the price. In 1936, Qian Xiang Wu headed to the United States to continue her studies in experimental physics. After graduating with a PhD from the University of California in 1940, Jian Chung Wu became a professor at Princeton University and Smith College. Wu was known to be demanding with her assignments but pushed her students to be their best 
and they loved her for it. World War II was fought and won with science, and in 1944, Qian Sheng Wu was recruited to Columbia University to work on the Manhattan Project. She helped develop a way to enrich uranium into the isotopes needed to fuel the atomic bomb. She helped to develop radiation detectors for the project as well. Well, I know some of you really like um, World War II history, so an interesting connection. After the war, Qian Chung Wu stayed at Columbia to start her work on beta decay. The theory called the law of conservation of parity predicted that radioactive atoms decay in a symmetrical way. But a new particle was discovered called the k mesin that didn't follow the rules. No one actually observed this worthy particle until, until Qian Sheng Wu did. She labored night and day, skipping vacations and forcing her assistants to work weekends with her. With the termination and a very strong magnet, Qian Sheng Wu observed that the electrons of these atoms broke away asymmetrically. She disproved the law of conservation of parity and changed the practice of physics forever. She published a book, Beta Decay, and was given many awards and honors. She continued to research and lecture around the globe into her old age. So I like that story of Qian Sheng Wu. And uh, we study physics this year, different types of physics. So I like that connection there. about Valentina Tereshkova. She was an engineer and a cosmonaut. Valentina Tereshkova was born in the USSR in 1937. Her family was so poor that they couldn't afford bread on their government allowance. She worked in a tire factory as a young girl and went on to work at a textile factory. It's like fabrics, there's textiles. Um, okay, but she dreamed of traveling and exploring the world. When the space race be between the United States and the USSR began, the USSR wanted to be the first to send a woman into space. Valentina was in a parachute club, jumping out of planes for fun. Would you do that? She was also an enthusiastic member of the Communist Party's Youth League. This made her a perfect candidate to become a cosmonaut. Remember, a cosmonaut is a, the Russian astronaut. <laughs> Valentina was selected to compete with four other women. The program was so top secret that their families did not even know about it. The training was physically intense, but Valentina prevailed and was chosen to be the first woman in space. Valentina flew solo into space on a shuttle called Vostok 6 in 1963. She orbited the Earth 48 times, setting a new world record. Or a new record, doesn't say world record, but I guess it's not. Are you in the world if you're orbiting it or are you outside of it? I guess it's a universe record. <laughs> All right. Uh-oh, I lost my spot. Okay, the photographs she took in space greatly contributed to gaining better understanding of the atmosphere. She had a bumpy ride back to Earth. There were problems in the ship's programming that she had to fix. Nauseated, I mean, she felt sick to her stomach. And disoriented, she manually corrected the error. 
On the way back to Earth, she passed out, woke up, bruised her nose, and had to stand on her head to get out of her parachute. Wow, what a what a welcome home. <laughs> uh, but, but hey, tough girl, right? Valentina showed the world that women are tough as nails. After her fight, Valentina earned a doctorate in engineering and continued to work closely with aerospace engineers and the cosmonaut program. She served on the Soviet Women's Committee starting in 1968 and continued to contribute to Russian politics and work for world peace. going to read about one more woman in science, and it is Saolan Wu. Saolan Wu was born in the early 1940s during the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong. Although, although Saolan Wu's mother was illiterate and uneducated, that means she couldn't read, so her mom couldn't read. She did whatever it took to make sure that Sao Lan Wu and her brother got a good education. Against her father's wishes, Sao Lan Wu applied to 50 different colleges in America. She was accepted to Vassar College with a full scholarship in 1960. The school provided her with room, board, that means like they feed you, clothing, and books. She graduated summa cum laude, and was accepted into Harvard's master's program in physics, the only woman admitted that year in her field. By the way, magna cum laude, or summa cum laude, is like top of your class, like um, all A's pretty much. It's like, it's like overall honor roll for college. After earning a PhD from Harvard, Sao Long Wu started researching partial physics, the study of matter, and how it works at MIT, DESY, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Atoms are made out of protons and neutrons, which are made of quarks. Cylon Wu was fascinated by these particles and has dedicated her life to discovering their secrets. With a research team led by Samuel Ting, Cylon Wu helped to discover the charm quark. And a type of, I mean, sorry, the charm, the charm quark, a type of elementary particle in 1974. After that first achievement, she became the lead on a research team that discovered the gluon, a particle that holds the quarks together. <laughs> One answered question in physics was how the tiny particles that make up an atom have mass. In 1964, a theory was created that mass depended on a subatomic particle named the Higgs boson, a unit of the Higgs field, which, ex which exists everywhere. The way particles interact with the field gives them more or less mass. To prove this theory, researchers face the difficult task of finding a Higgs boson. Ceylon Wu said, it is like looking for a needle in a haystack, the size of a football stadium. With a particle collider, Wu led one of the teams working to find proof that these teeny tiny subatomic particles. In 2012, her team was instrumental in observing the Higgs boson. Ceylon Wu is one of the most important particle physicists in her field and has made many groundbreaking discoveries. She continues to teach and research what all the stuff in the universe is made of. Were you a little confused with that? I know um, some of those words I don't really know, but that is something that is her passion, something that has driven her, and something that she has thrived in. So I love that story, and I hope you did too.
Okay, so we just read only a few of the stories of women in science. There are actually 50 fearless pioneers stories in here um, of women who changed the world. And so whoever you are, I hope you can take these stories to let them inspire you to follow your dreams and your passions so you can become the best version of you. If you want to read more of the stories from Women in Science, 50 Fearless Pioneers Who Changed the World, check the book out at your local library. All right, that's it for me. Take care. Peace.